Welcome again to the course on audio signal processing for music applications. This week we're talking about the sinusoidal model. And in the previous uh, theory lecture we presented uh, the actual model and a little bit about how these uh, sinusoids can be uh, visualized in the spectral domain. So let's continue with that. We will first uh, overview a little bit the model and then focus on the idea of detecting peaks in the spectral domain which are going to be our sinusoids and also uh, we're going to be talking about how to track them in time so these sine waves uh, varying time in a particular sound so how can we track these uh, time varying sine waves in a spectrogram so the sine uh, the model is, uh, is, is simple it's a sum of time varying uh, sinusoids and in the previous class we made emphasis on this idea that we need to detect these sinusoids in the frequency domain therefore we need to choose a window size that is good enough to be able to uh, isolate those sinusoids or at least uh, be able to visually uh, have uh, separate peaks for these sinusoids okay in this particular case these two sinusoids 440 and 490 we need a window size of 5,291 samples in order for being able to have these two main lobes uh, separate. But how do we measure the values of the sinusoids in the spectrum? Well, if we choose uh, the window size correctly, as we showed, we will have a peak for every sinusoid in the signal. Then, to measure the frequency and amplitude of each sinusoid, we have to just find the tip of the peak and uh, its height. So we defined uh, a peak as the location in the magnitude spectrum, so P sub R, the peak, is going to be the magnitude spectrum at the location K sub 0 when uh, the previous location, so the location of the spectrum when K sub 0 minus 1 is smaller, and the next location, so the location at K sub 0 plus 1 is also smaller. So that's going to be what we call a local maximum. So in this uh, plot, we see a local maxima for uh, the different peaks. Okay, so the, the, the crosses, the blue crosses, are local maxima. And also in the phase spectrum, what we basically do is just read the location of this uh, local maxima in the phase spectrum. So we have with this uh, procedure, we have the location of the, of the peak, which is going to be k sub 0. Then we have the magnitude, which is going to be mx of k sub 0. And we have the phase, which is going to be px of k sub 0. But there is a little problem. Uh, in fact, you can uh, visually uh, may, uh, identify this problem. There is not enough resolution. So one solution to this resolution problem is to do zero padding. Uh, we use uh, an FFT size much larger than the window size and we have been talking about that. So for example in this particular example we have increased the FFT size of the previous example by two. The window size was the same but we added zero to the n up to the next power of two and this results into a much smoother spectrum and now the local maxima computed in the same way so these uh, blue crosses are much better they are located in, in visually you can uh, you can see that they are located in a in a better place they are loca located in a place that looks like is more the center of the peak and therefore the magnitude and the phase will be better but if we want a good enough resolution, we will need to increase the FFT size a lot. And that will be quite computationally expensive. So is there any other solution? Well, yes. Uh, we can uh, do a cheaper interpolation by using, for example, parabolic interpolation. The parabola is a function with a shape quite similar to the tip of the lobe of the spectrum of the analysis window in the dB scale. So this is the equation of a parabola where uh, P is the center of the parabola, A is the concavity measure 
and B is the offset. And this is a sampled version of the parabola, so we have uh, the different values n, uh, and so uh, this is uh, very similar to what we would see as a sampled uh, function. Okay. So to perform a parabolic interpolation on a spectral peak, we can just use the three highest values of the magnitude of the peak. So for example, in this case, the, the k minus 1, k and k plus 1 locations of the mx spectrum can be considered to be the three highest values of a parabola. So the x minus 1, x0 and x1. And then we can apply uh, the, uh, the equation of the parabola in a way to find where would be the center of this uh, parabola. And the center of the parabola will be defined by this equation in which uh, uh, k sub p, which will be the kind of the frequency or the location of the center, would be equal to this uh, k, that, that was the, the the highest point plus these uh, these values which is going to be the the previous and the next values and compute it in uh, in this way and then it's going to be very easy to read what would be the amplitude of uh, this uh, value so we can basically plug in the interpolated k sub p into uh, the parabolic uh, equation and obtain the amplitude the height of uh, this peak. Okay, so with this equation, basically we can um, refine the peak positions um, and we can combine it with the zero padding so to get a much a better result. So this example is exactly that. There is some uh, parabolic interpolation together with some zero padding. And if you would zoom into this, you would see that this is uh, quite a bit better than the, the two previous examples, the one without any zero padding or the one with just zero padding. So this will give us uh, quite a good measure of frequency, amplitude and phase of all the sinusoids uh, pleasant, uh, present in a spectrum. So we will get uh, these, so we'll get a value of the frequency location of a peak, k sub p, and it will be computed uh, with this equation. Then we can convert this uh, k into, uh, into hertz, into frequency, uh, by multiplying by the sampling rate and divided by n. Then we can compute the amplitude uh, by uh, using this, uh, this parabolic uh, idea. And finally, the phase will be uh, very straightforward. We can just read the phase of that location, and this doesn't even have to have any, any interpolation by just reading the closest that uh, should be enough. But these are the values of a single frame, and the sinusoidal model is about time-varying sounds. So, time-varying sinusoid. So, how do we go about that? Um, so we have to deal with spectrograms and, and find time-varying sinusoids. And we will define a time-varying sinusoid as a stable peak track in the spectrogram. So this, uh, this variability will be uh, constrained and we will define a sort of peaks that evolve in time, that sort of move in time, but not so much. And this stability uh, will be measured by the frequency and amplitude of successive frames. We could also look at the phase derivative in time frequency for that. In practice, we are going to just focus on the frequency and amplitude uh, variability, but the phase is also a very interesting uh, uh, value to look at. So the condition for a peak uh, of a frame to be part of a track is defined by this equation. Uh, so a, a, a peak, a particular frequency of a peak f sub p of a given uh, of a given frame l will be part of a track uh, if the the distance between that uh, frequency and the frequency of the previous uh, frame. 
so that track is coming from uh, from the previous frame if that the absolute value of this uh, difference is smaller than a threshold and also if it exists uh, a track for a certain amount of time so we will uh, be uh, con making a constraint in terms of the frequency in terms of that it doesn't change that much and at the same time we will make it a constraint in terms of how long has this uh, track been in existence if it's uh, too short it means it's like a short burst and that's not really uh, a sinusoid um, so this is an example uh, of tracking uh, these uh, sine waves in a, in a sound in a bendir. Bendir is a drum uh, used in Turkey and uh, several other places so this is a non-harmonic sound so it's a sound that is quite complex but it has uh, partials, it has uh, sinusoids and we can track them so with this algorithm these uh, black lines correspond to the tracking but let's uh, let's hear uh, the bendy first okay so it's a, it's an instrument that uh, doesn't have a clear pitch and therefore the the tracks are a little bit uh, kind of very unstable and they keep uh, changing and appearing and disappearing so these uh, this is what uh, we would find. And also we can look at uh, the same tracks in the phase spectrum. So if we take the phase spectrogram, which is the derivative of the, of the phase, and we plot those black lines, the, the frequency tracks on top of that, we get this result. And it's quite interesting because clearly we see that the black tracks are in the places where the color is uh, clear and these are the the locations where the phases changes less where there is more phase continuity so this indicates that also the phase information would be quite relevant in tracking these uh, sinusoids because the the phase information allows us to distinguish this variability stability aspect of a given partial so sorry, uh, there are not that many uh, references on these topics. Uh, so apart from the Wikipedia entry for sinusoidal model, or uh, of course uh, Julius Smith uh, discussion on all this spectral analysis on his online book, and that's uh, basically it. So this is all for uh, this lecture. Uh, we have presented the sinusoidal model, uh, uh, sound representation built on top of the short time Fourier transform that reduces the amount of information and that get rid of uh, non-relevant spectral components. However, its use uh, for the analysis of sound is not as easy as the use of the STFT. We have to understand a bit more about spectra and about windows in order to make uh, good use of this model. Hopefully by now you're starting to get a grasp on that. Now we have to complete the explanation of the sinusoidal model by, by describing the synthesis part and this is what we'll be doing in the next lecture. So I hope to see you then. Bye-bye.